Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am the host and founder of Prep Athletics, Corey Heights. And today on our show, we are proud to welcome my friend, Kevin Kehoe. Kevin is the coach at the Winchenden School in Winchenden, Massachusetts. And prior to this, he was the head coach at the Cheshire School, where in 2014, he won a NEPSEC championship. And that year, he was also voted as coach of the year. Uh, prior to that, he's also coached at the JUCO level at Naugatuck Valley, and D2 at Post University in Connecticut. Kevin played junior college ball at Tunxis Community College before enrolling at Ottawa University in Kansas. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Corey. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so let's go back. Where did you grow up? And of all the sports to pick, why'd you pick basketball? Um, born, born in New York in Queens, but moved up to Connecticut with my family when I think I was in second grade. Um, typical, you know, basketball, baseball, football, that's what we did all year. Um, uh, played all three, um, you know, football wasn't quite big enough and, um, basketball I fell in love with and, um, you know, that was it started, I think at six years old and has been going ever since. Gotcha. And you ended up playing at Tunks. First of all, why'd you pick this junior college to go to? What was the logic on that? Because you and I, we always talk about recruiting and where kids go, et cetera, et cetera. How'd you end up going that route? Probably the main reason, Corey, is I, I originally went to Central Connecticut. I knew it was a mistake. Um, and, I, and I got out real early. And the main reason why I coach now is the main reason I went to junior college. Because when I was a high school kid, you know, we thought we had good grades because we were passing. We thought we had good SATs because, you know, back, back when we were younger, 930 wasn't good. Now 930 is OK. And um, I put my emphasis on the sport. And I, I was the opposite of student athlete. I was an athlete student. And that was the way that was the best way for me to go. And that's the main reason why I got into coaching, because I didn't want another kid to do what I did. Gotcha. But you went to junior college in Connecticut and ended up in Kansas? Yeah. How'd that work out? <laughs> uh, another interesting story, but um, Reader's Digest version is I had to go NAIA because um, I didn't take junior college serious my first go round. And um, my five years to play four, the clock was burnt, but NAIA was 10 semesters to play eight. And Ottawa University recruited me. Um, and the head coach, I guess, did a pretty good job. And that was it. Out, 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 to, out to the land of Oz. <laughs> and based on these lessons you learned by being an athlete student, you know, how do you incorporate that now with your kids? Uh, you know, everybody tells the story about the ball stops bouncing and the ball gets taken away from you and you need um, something to fall back on. And really, that's what it boils down to. I mean, I say to all my kids, I hope you prove me wrong. I hope you go and earn money playing this game. You know, I think I've had like 13 players play overseas. Um, that's great. But just in case I'm right and you're wrong, I want to make sure that you have something to fall back on. And that's a college degree and ability to make a living without the ball in your hands. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. Now, you're at Winston School, which back in the 90s uh, was just a powerhouse, right? Correct. 10 D1 t guys on a, at a time on the team. A lot of pros came out of there. And you took it over a couple of years ago. Tell us a little bit about Winston School and give us your pitch that you give players on why to come to the school and why to play for you. Well, first off, the school itself is about an hour and 20 minutes west of Boston. Um, it is in a small community, safe community, 300 acre campus, um, 300 students, give or take co-educational. Uh, the thing that I find best about Winchenden is first off being in the NEPSAC. I mean, New England prep school basketball. I don't know if it's true or not, but most recruiting analysts say that's the Mecca 
of, of prep school and high school basketball. So of course we're gonna we're gonna use that to our advantage. But um, you know, getting away from home, getting to live in a college setting, this is what I tell our kids about. You know, when 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 you go to college, everybody on your team was all league, all suburban, all state, all conference, all American, ev everything. And there are great basketball players that never get off the bench at the college level because they can't morph into that guy that the team needs. And so I think one of the first things I tell a kid going to prep schools, everybody that comes to Winchenden was all state, all conference, all everything. So you are learning how to become a college teammate before your eligibility starts. You are learning how to live in a small community whether it be just a dorm living or just the campus itself before your eligibility starts. You are learning to advocate for yourself before your eligibility starts. That's why I really think college coaches like recruiting prep school kids, the homesickness and all the adjustments are already taken care of before you get there. And that's what my main pitch is to our kids. Um, why play for me? There's a lot of great coaches. Uh, I coach against them every day. I think I think I'm passionate and I think I work as hard as any coach out there. You know, this past year during the COVID year, we had 14 kids, all 14 got placed in college. And that's what our main goal has always been. And I tell our kids this, Corey, if I recruit a good player, if I can build his body, if I can make him better and get recruited out to college, the wins take care of themselves. It's, it's, it's the system that we put together. And I think we put a good system together. We put a big emphasis on weightlifting. We have a full-time strength and fitness and conditioning coach. Um, I don't even see our guys in the weight room, you know, because I didn't go to school and get a degree in it. But three days a week, six o'clock in the morning, guys are lifting. Because the first thing, and you know, Corey, you play college basketball. First thing coach asks, can I get them into the school academically? Second thing coach always wants to know. Does he have the body to compete in my conference? The body of an ACC player is different than the body of a CAA player, which is different than the body of an NE10 player. And those are the things that I think we do really well. And that's why I tell kids they should come play for us. Gotcha. And now you've incorporated a second team as well. Tell me about that second team and what it's like playing for that, how placement goes. Are they getting, are they getting Coach Kehoe as much as or not as much? Tell me about that. The, the, the second team is, you know, so many people are coming up with yeah, yeah, national team, regional team, varsity A, varsity B. What, what we're doing right now is because the NEPSAC limits how many teams you can have in the NEPSAC playing and competing for a championship. So what we're doing is we're going double A NEPSAC and double A independent. And the only difference between the two is one of them will compete if, if they do well enough and get selected for the NEPSAC tournament, and the other one will not compete for the NEPSAC tournament. But there, there's, this, there's this thing about AA and AAA that everybody, you know, I, I've got to play in that. You know, what, what you really need to do is you need to play in the right system for you. OK, now our system across the board between the two programs, um, I don't want to say they're identical because that would take away from the second head coach. But our belief, our philosophy is identical. Both teams work out simultaneously. The only time they split is in season. The recruitment is done by the entire coaching staff. The way that we've developed it is, you know, the team I coach and I oversee the whole program. Then the head coach of the independent team, he will also be in charge of something we haven't decided this year throughout the whole program. It, 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 it may be academic support. It may be the other head coaches involved with player development. So it's really one program until we get in season and then we play a separate game. So that's how we run it. Gotcha. And then there are other teams now joining this double A independent that are second teams. So it will be great competition. And I mean, it's my two cents is if a team goes zero and 30 in the NEPSAC, but every kid gets placed at the right level, that's a successful season. 
right? I've never gotten a raise in 2014 when we won the championship. And in 2018, when we had five wins, I didn't get fired. Yeah. Um, there's a thing that our college counseling department looks for and our head of school looks for. It's called a matriculation list. Where are you sending your kids to college? You know, we are sending our kids to Ohio University. We are sending our kids to NYU. We are sending our kids to University of Rochester. Um, that, that's what the prep schools are looking for. There's not an asterisk next to the kid who's going to NYU that says basketball player probably wouldn't have gotten in without basketball. You know, he was a great student athlete. He had 30 on his ACT. He had a 3.9 GPA. Now, that doesn't necessarily get you admitted into NYU, but it's not like he had a 2-0, but they took him because of basketball. Right. And the matriculation list is the most important thing. And that's what we're doing at Winchenden um, with all our athletics is we're placing them in, in high-end colleges. Yeah, absolutely. During COVID, Kevin, uh, during COVID, did you come up with any new outside the box or new coaching techniques that you had not used before just based on the conditions? No, no. Um, early on in the year, we were talking about that all the time. And we found ourselves shortchanging the kids. Uh, I guess the only thing that we did that would be different was we gave them more breaks because we were mandated to practice and play with masks on. Mm. Um, but, you know, Corey, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Everybody's like, you know, I guess Zoom calls. Yeah, Zoom calls. I, I can sit in my office and talk to the whole team. But as far as coaching wise, Kids want to be coached hard. Great players want to be coached even harder. Um, we did not skip a beat with that. We did not skip a beat with physicality. We did not skip a beat with um, accountability. I, I found so many people saying to me, you know, oh, I feel so sorry for these kids. And one of my postgraduates, um, dad said to me, I feel more sorry for you, coach. I said, why is that? He says, all your PGs, they know nothing about prep school. They just think this the way it is. You remember what it was like before COVID. He says, you have it tougher than they do. And that just kind of, it, it grounded me a little to say, hey, guys, it's all about just accountability and coaching and, and, and pushing somebody to a level that they didn't know they can get to. Yeah. So COVID did. I think I become a better coach every year because I, I, listen to other coaches. I go to coaching clinics, but that's not COVID driven. That's just passion for the sport. Right. With COVID and the difficulty you had placing kids, did that change how you're going to now recruit kids? Like, are you going to take a different type of kid now that maybe you wouldn't have taken before just because it's going to be more difficult to place them now? No, no. Okay. No, no because we, I, I don't sit at a million tournaments watching kids play because I'd be in the same position that college coaches are where you're recruiting jump shots and crossover dribbles and, and you're not recruiting the person. You know, most of my recruiting is done through people I know and people who recommend they should, um, a kid should come play for me or I should go recruit a kid. That way the kid's already vetted. I know he's a good human being. If, if, if you know, Derek Hamilton down in Georgia says, hey, Kev, you, you should get this kid. He's your type of kid. I don't need to worry about him in the dorms at two o'clock in the morning. So I'm always going to recruit a high academic, high caliber kid. We'll get him better in basketball. We'll get him bigger, stronger, quicker, faster. But we're sending somebody to a college coach. The one thing I, I hate, and I've had it a few times early in my career, um, a kid that's just not a great kid. And you end up getting them recruited by a coach that you don't know because you'd feel guilty sending them to a coach you do know. And so we'll never change quality kid, quality grades. All the kids that are coming to prep school, good basketball players. Mm -hmm. But we, we recruit the person. Yeah, no, that's good. Hey, we're going to do a special segment in the show now called Famous Alumni from Winchenden. Oh, God. <laughs> So I'm going to quiz you. And if you don't know, no big deal. There's, it's just, it's just light and fun. And then you can add anyone that maybe I left off. 
All okay. right. Uh, and this is uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. So I didn't go any deeper in my research <laughs> than that. Greg Selko. Greg Selko, no clue. Okay. He uh, is a founder of an e-commerce streetwear clothing line called Karma Loop. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's number one. Number two, oh. Jermaine Johnson. Yes, sir. He was Andrew Yang's South Carolina um, director of something, and now he's running for Congress himself. Uh, came out of Los Angeles. He um, went to Charleston, uh, University of Charleston, and he's a, he's a doctor now. He's uh, been in touch with the program, and he's a great guy. Yeah, also played in the, in the D, former D League. So, yeah. Good one. Okay. And last one, uh, Francisco Garcia. Cisco. How about this? Started at Cheshire Academy, ended at Winchenin. I started at Cheshire Academy. I'm at Winchenin. Um, I saw Cisco playing when he was like a little skinny freshman. I'd be in Cheshire Academy before I was coaching there, running an AAU program there. And this kid would just play. Um, 16 years in the NBA, drafted by the Kings. I know he had a good stint with the Rockets. I believe that Cisco right now is the director of basketball for the Dominican Republic. Oh, that makes sense. Um, just a fabulous kid. Okay. Anyone I left off of there you want to mention? Uh, you, 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 you know, there's, if you look at our alumni list, I, I, I would really tell you that besides St. Thomas More and MCI, who isn't even as prep school really anymore. Um, there aren't many lists that can boast who, who did play at Winchenin. Um, you know, Boris Sando from uh, Croatia. You know, Boris went straight from Winchenin to drafted by the Dallas Mavericks. Um, that was a pretty interesting one. Um, I just spoke to Devon Sadler the other day. Called me just out of blue. Um, Devon from Aberdeen, Maryland, came to Winston in PG year, was recruited by University of Delaware, all-time leading scorer at Delaware, and um, played a bunch of years overseas, became um, Belarus. He was granted citizenship, played on the national team. He just moved back to the Massachusetts area with his wife and children. It's like, Coach, I'm getting involved with AAU basketball. How can we help each other? That's um, great. Just, just the alone, and they go on and on and on. So, you know, you you hit. I was happy to get two out of three. I'm, I'm going to have to look up this other guy. That's an interesting. That's an interesting one. Well, the thing is, I'm I, you know, there's there's amazing alumni from the past probably 150 years that have come out of Winchester, and this is all that's on Wikipedia. So I'm sure there's state senators, doctors, lawyers, movers and shakers. So I have no oh, doubt about it, that. It's 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 crazy. Like you know what? A lot of college coaches. Really. And you have a to lot of your head. Like, or, or like Scotty Spinelli, who was the associate head coach at Boston College the last couple of years, he cut his teeth under Mike Burns at Winchester. You know, the, um, the head coach at Lawrence Academy cut his teeth coaching as an assistant at Winchester. And, 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 and there's a bunch of others. Gotcha. And then you also coached like Steve Donnelly and Ben Farmer back in the AAU days, right? Yep. Yep. Tell me about your AAU program. Like, what was that like when you ran it? Was that just a bunch of Connecticut kids, or did you have a certain kind yeah, of was, you, you know, it was before the sneaker company and the gauntlets and the EYBLs. Um, and, and it was kind of more like neighborhood teams. And, um, you know, we, we were kind of like we are at, at Winchin. We were high academic um, teams. And, you know, kids like... Benny, who played at Marist, but, um, you know, Joey Trapani, who played at Boston College, Timmy Abramitis, that played at Notre Dame, and Steve Ongley, who now is uh, an assistant coach. Um, I think one of the first HBCU um, Caucasian assistant coaches down at Howard. Um, Steve played with us, um, Tyler Olander from UConn. Uh, so we, we, we had a bunch of players, uh, Jerry Quinn's, Two sons played for us. Um, you know, it was a fun time. It was, yeah. it was just a fun time. Just going to tournaments, last one standing, turn the lights out and go home. Yeah, It was, it was a great time. The old days. Um, now, you also have a little bit of a recruiting service for football players. And I know your sons were good football players. Tell us a little bit about when that started and why it started. Uh, 1995. And... 
what what I saw, especially in the state of Connecticut, Corey, is that there, there was not a lot of exposure. There was not a lot of college recruitment and, and to no fault of anybody. You know, I could go down to Texas and in one game, I may be seeing 22 Division One players. You know, I could go down to Florida, I may be seeing 22 of them. You know, up here in Connecticut, you had to go to one game to see to Bucky Jones, or you had to go to one game to see John Sullivan. And it just, it just wasn't fair because there were good players out there. And the other thing is, you know, football is statistics driven. You know, your 40 time, your vertical, your L shuttle, your three cone shuttle. Um, guys get recruited just on that because of, it's just the way the sport is. So I got involved in it. I really enjoyed it. Help kids get to college. And that's, you know, what, that's what you and I are made of. That's our DNA. You know, we help kids get to college. Um, I did basketball and football simultaneously. But when I got into coaching, I, I, I just found it to be a cleaner break mm -hmm. just to get my own players recruited where I coach. And, and, and really on the football end, it's kind of like I get a phone call from somebody, hey, can you help this kid? You know, absolutely. And really, it, it is that the basic statistics, then that's, that's how a lot of this is recruited for football versus basketball. Well, you know, ba basketball in a way, you know, if I, 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 I had a coach, actually a scout for an NBA team years and years ago, and they were deciding between Dennis Smith Jr. and Hamadou Diallo, and they knew Dennis Smith, and the coach, the, the scout called me up, who, who was a friend of mine, says, you coach against him, what do you think? I said, well, first off, he's the freakiest athlete in the world, and they said, yeah, absolutely. I said, if he was a wide receiver, he'd be Randy Moss. And, you know, but that's for another story. But once again, they were going off statistics in basketball, not as seriously as football. I mean, you, you, you turn 4 two forty in football and, and you're getting every power five conference recruiting you. They don't even know if you can play yet. But, um, you know, it's less so in basketball. Maybe the where it comes up in basketball is height. You got a six ten kid; um, he's probably going somewhere for free. It just depends on yeah, you know, what high, level, high, mid, low, right? You know the thing that I'm noticing, Corey. Maybe maybe you see this too. I, I'm seeing height become a secondary thing to length. Mm. They'll recruit a six eight with a seven four wingspan. I think quicker than a seven foot kid with six eight wingspan because they, they're getting six, eight quickness, but seven, four extension. And so I, I, I see a lot of recruitment right now going to length more than height. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, wingspans included more now on profiles than, than was five years ago. Right. It just oh, so, wasn't a thing. It's unbelievable. Help me on this guards, right? You and I probably get reached out to more guards and not you and me in, in general, but everybody in the coaching world gets reached out to by guards. Right. And it's such a fine line that makes a guard a scholarship player versus not. What do you tell guards if they want to play at a scholarship level that they need to have or do? One saying, be that guy to make that play in that moment. You'll go to school for free. And I'll tell you, classic example, Richie Kelly. Came out of high school. Amherst was the only school recruiting him. Did a PG year with us. And, um, you know, three years at Quinnipiac Division I, one year at Boston College, third leading scorer, now taking the COVID year and finishing up already with a master's degree at the University of Massachusetts. Five years ago, Amherst was the only school recruiting them. Be that guy to make that play in that moment. And it doesn't okay. matter your size. It doesn't even matter what the play is. Is it a jump shot? Is it a charge? You know? What, what, what is the play, that play, that play that is needed to win the game right now. Those are the guards that play in college. Gotcha. What about um, the transfer rule? What are your thoughts on that? Probably the worst thing ever happened in college basketball. You know, you can basically, you can basically recruit layup lines. It's, it's, it's just, it, it, it's the, what have you done for me lately era? 
what whatever happened to the freshman that was proud to carve out 12 minutes a game behind an All-American and having the coach saying, you know what, year or two, you stay in that weight room, that's going to be you, son. What, what's wrong with those days? Why, when you graduate high school, have you earned the right never to sit on a bench again the rest of your life? Um, I, I just... <laughs> You, you know, if, if you transfer, you got to sit here, you know, and, 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 and it, it's now I, I don't blame the kids and the coaches as much now, because I, I think the transfer rate has changed trajectory wise every single year that the NCAA has shortened the recruiting period. Correct. The transfer rate has gone up because like I said earlier, guys recruit jump shots and crossover dribbles. You can't sit down and get to know a kid. And so where, where's the problem? So my next question would be, what would you do to change the NCAA? And I'm assuming your answer would be more live periods for more evaluation. Yeah, I, I, I have a funny feeling that the live periods get cut down because of the schools that can just say who their name is to recruit a kid versus outworking everybody. Um, Division three, you can recruit year round. Well, it's a non-revenue generating sport. So, you know, I don't say you get to recruit all year round. That's crazy, but I would have more evaluation periods. Um, another thing that I would do with the NBA and or the NCAA and it has to do with the NBA is years ago they said well you know the one and done rule was because a guy couldn't go out and make a living well they can now it's proven they go they go to Europe they go to the D-League why can't the NCAA adopt in basketball the same rule that's in effect in baseball and football you don't want to come to college you go play prep you come day one you can't get drafted until three years. Right. Now, before it was because an, a, a baseball guy could go make a living. Football guys, they 18-year-olds just get killed in the league. But because now a kid has the ability to make a living, if he comes in as a freshman, he can't get drafted for three years. I, I, I think that would help the game so much. How many, I mean... I mean, we, we go back to, you know, being in Connecticut with UConn, you know, Tate George catching the pass from Scotty Burrell and, you know, Daniel Marshall. We, I, 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 honestly, I, I don't know if I know two UConn players' names. You know? And I don't think that's just me, Corey. It's I not. think that we now watch basketball for the love of basketball, not for the love of our program, our state school or whatever, whatever the passion is, because guys don't stay long enough. You know, the example I use, Kevin, being from my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky, uh, is Kentucky. And now, like, every year I'll have to see the roster, and I'll watch the first couple games, and I'll say, like, okay, this guy's number 28 in the 100. This guy's number five. This is another McDonald's All-American. I have no idea who they are. And by the time I figure out who they are, it's the NCAA tournament, and then win or lose, then, bam, they're declaring for the draft, and I've got to start over again. And I know last year's Kentucky yeah. team had one guy left over from the previous year. Yeah. And Kentucky fans are just they, – they can't get behind the, a, a guy that's just going to be there as a mercenary. And it's – you know, Joe Mantegna over at uh, Blair Academy is fears that NCAA basketball is going to go the way of Major League Baseball and boxing to where it's just – it's only for hardcore fans in the future. Because there's going to be no Christian Leitner staying three years. There's going to be no – um, you know, Patrick Ewing staying three years that the whole country can get behind, you know. Patrick uh, stayed four. There, four. there, okay. there was bet. just on ESPN2 last night, it's Ahmad Rashad does a uh, interview show. And he had, Pat. I, ironically, he had Patrick, he had Clyde Drexler on another one. And uh, Patrick Ewing was just absolutely Fabulous. First off, he's one of the nicest guys in the world. He, uh, I had a player that he was recruiting a couple of years back, and, and the guy was great to deal with. But he was told by, like, Elvin Hayes and Wes Unsell, you know, you should come to the NBA right now because 
they, John Thompson would, would introduce him to these guys and they saw him play. And all Patrick says, I made promises to my mom that I'd get a college degree. Um, just, just phenomenal. But you're, you're, you're right. The, these guys, you don't, you don't see them anymore. Well, now that mom would be trying to broker a shoe deal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause now well, parents this, are savvy too. Right. This, this NIL is gonna be kind of crazy. Also. The NIL, Kevin, I think is going to be so fascinating because I've seen already just one headline that the Alabama quarterbacks are already up to a million dollars in endorsements. Right, right. I saw that also. Already, and you know, he, he hasn't taken a snap, by the way. I know. It's a. I think this is going to be so interesting. And you know, if I'm a car dealership, instead of me sponsoring like the local arena, like it happens in Lexington, Kentucky, I'm going to now yep. sponsor the team and give everyone a Ford pickup. And just say, hey, you can drive this your whole career here. You're driving this around town so everyone can see you in it versus looking at a billboard up in an arena. And I think it's going to get so crazy, the bidding wars that will happen between a USC and Alabama a Notre Dame or Michigan. I, it, it's going to be nuts, and I don't know how the game's going to turn out. What are your thoughts on that football-wise? Uh, football-wise, it's been like that for years. In, in 2011 – we were running a combine and um, the offensive coordinator from North Carolina state was there. I knew the guy pretty well. He's just watching kids and talking. He told me in 2011 that there will be a thing called the power five. He was right. He goes, you need to understand if I need to see a kid in California and I wake up on a Monday morning, I jump on a plane. I'm there Monday night. And he says, if I get too much, time and I, I can't get there quick enough i'll take a helicopter to the airport to get on the plane and my credit card's paid every day and he says i'm not even at one of the big time schools so it's been going on forever um the thing that i am really curious about and this this is i'd like your opinion on this how is the private colleges, the private institutions versus the state schools, because there is more financial governing on a state school level? Is, is that going to come into play? Is the private school going to be able to come up with, let's just say, you, more investors? Because that's what they really are. Well, state schools like Alabama, LSU, they're going to be just fine. In fact, they're probably building a war chest right now, right? Yeah. Kentucky no public school going to do the same thing for basketball. Um, I want what well, one of my questions for you and well, let's stay on NIL, but let's talk about recruiting, right? So let's say you've got a top 100 player and he's getting recruited by three power five schools. You almost now have to kind of see on top of uh, academic fit, coaching, all that, like, Hey, maybe can we make a hundred K here at this school? And maybe we're only making 25 here. Have you even thought about that now when you're talking to kids about placement? Because no. you're going to have to if you haven't. No, but, but here, here's, here's the thing, and it, it's probably sad, but a kid that will have that problem, kid that will have that opportunity, um, is listening to somebody way above the level of me. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're just there uh, to get him a little better, make sure he doesn't get hurt and keep the bad people away from him. Though, though if, if you have that luxury, you're, you're already fast trained. All right. Well, let's, let's do a what if situation here. So your son was a quarterback at Delaware, correct? Correct. Okay. Let's say now. We're in a time machine to where he's now going to be uh, finish his. He's going to graduate in 2022, and he has great offers on the table from dream schools. Would finance or three dream schools that he he have a great experience at all three? Would you, as a father, advising him if money came up and was more significant at one school versus the other? Would that would that cloud your decision? Would it make it easier? Have you even thought about this? Are are are, are the school? Are the schools equal academically? Let's assume for this for this debate. Are, are, yes. are the are the coaches the type like what I say to a mom and dad? You you need to decide if I'm the guy that you would like finishing off what you have spent 18 years 
doing with your child. So are, if all the coaches, you would love your kid to be around and all the academics are all the same. For this conversation, yes. I would take the money. Because especially in football, due to the fact that you're one hit away from possibly being paralyzed. And, you know, I mean, that's a little dramatic, but I, I've seen guys on flat boards. Kevin, this is all new, this NIL. Has the NCAA come out with language on it yet or rules? Do you know? No, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So you can even go down to the D3 level. So Amherst can potentially compete against Williams for a kid. Yeah. At an so now my, one of my questions to you is how do you help advise kids on which college to pick? But now you're almost going to have to figure out like this new wild west to where maybe a kid wants to go to a school that's offered him, but this other school he wasn't thinking about as much now is putting up some money or some opportunity through a local business. This could really muddy the waters and make an arms race instead of us looking at coaches or academics now. Oh, it's, now it's, definitely, it's, it's definitely going to. But you, you know as well as I do, we, we are going to put the pros and cons out to our kids. We are going to answer honestly every and any question they ask. And then we will let them make an educated decision. You know, we're, 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 we're just, we're Wikipedia in this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and dollars and cents are going to come up just like coaches, just like degree majors. You know, I, you know, like I, I, I want, pre-med well a lot of a lot of coaches like well if you want pre-med you know you gotta look at johns hopkins no 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 you don't you you gotta look at johns hopkins for med school you want to get to a school where it's a very good pre-med program but not overwhelming because you want your gpa as high as possible you know nobody goes up to a doctor and says hey hanging on your wall where's your undergraduate degree right you know, your med school. so you know we we're wikipedia to these kids now we just got to add a new component which is okay let's talk to dollars and cents you know there and if you think at the d3 level it could be crazier than division one because i mean think of the guys from nyu think of the guys from from Amherst, from Williams, from from MIT. I mean, we we talk about deep pockets. You you're talking Fortune 200 CEOs. I just thought of some. So the thing about D3 is no scholarships, right? So say right. I'm a good player from a middle class family, and I'm looking at it like ah, I'd really rather get a scholarship than pay 40k a year at Amherst, right? Yeah. Now maybe that's where. It, Amherst brings in the local business guys like, oh, we need you on this team. We'll do something for you for NIL, and you can apply that towards your tuition. Now maybe that's how these D3 schools come into the mix on some kids. And maybe Ivy Leagues too because you have the same issue there. Golly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be it's gonna be so interesting. I'm just spitballing here. This stuff's just coming to me. But, I mean, I'm telling you, it, this, th this is going to be so interesting. You know, Talking last year at this time with you, we were curious to see how the COVID season was going to play out, right? And yeah. now a year later, we saw most everyone got placed. Maybe not the level they wanted, but everyone got placed. There was a season everyone may do. Now it'll be interesting to talk to you about this, Kevin, a year from now to see how the NIL yeah. shaped up both in every level, different sports. I, I think it's fascinating. And I, I wonder now in the locker room, here's a question to ask you. If there's one kid, the point guard's getting paid 100 k and the guy that outperforms them in practice is getting paid 5K, will there now be, you know, drama that wouldn't have been there previously to the NIL? Every new thing that's brought into a locker room creates drama. And of course it will. But now is the 5K kid going to transfer just because of that money? What if someone else gives them a better offer, right? Under the table. I it's, mean, it's, this it's, is fascinating that there's a whole new can of worms that just – um, we'll have to really keep track of, but you now as a coach are going to have to incorporate this into your decision with play or to your advising with players. When you look at yeah. academics, location, majors, coaches, style of play, uh, tuition assistance. Now you'll have to offer this in as well. And it's going to be hard to advise because it is such a blank landscape right now. And, and, and it's at, at the high level, you're, you're talking about some, some kids can set themselves up for life would never even play in professional sports if they do it right in college. Right. 
you know, it's. And think how creative you can get, like the car leasing. Think about Kentucky. Hey, we can't pay you now. We can give you a racehorse. You know, you can be 10% into that or yeah. property or stocks or gosh, darn, whatever. It's just, it's unbelievable. All right. Uh, I don't, I don't see just in closing. <laughs> I don't see a good ending to it. I, I, I believe in amateurism. Why is that? Do you feel that the scholarship for the kids that are getting scholarships is good enough? Um, I, I feel for the fact that they're getting a scholar. I, I, I dare any 18 year old kid to get a $75,000 job out of high school first off, but in the same turn too, they've already incorporated um, cost of attendance. That's a great one. Like, like my son's, I, I, I don't know, this is at University of Delaware. This wasn't at an SEC school. They were getting like an extra $1,500 a year just because they went to school. Okay. And then, and then you take the fact that you're, you're, you're getting quote unquote meal money there at the division one level, there's Five dollars minimum, I think ninety-five dollars maximum. You got two, three games a week. Let's just say you're getting seventy-five dollars for meal money for three games, right? That's two and a quarter, right? Plus you're getting your stipend because you decide to live off campus. These college, trust me, I walked into my two sons' apartment and they had granite tops, cattle tops. They lived in a four-bedroom condo. Um, a health club right next door. Hey, you know, these kids aren't living that bad, Corey. So, you know, how how much is enough? Think about this too, Kevin. Say I am a normal college student having the academic workload, the basketball workload, which is always pretty, you know, doesn't give you much time for free time. And then on top of that, you're trying to negotiate deals. You're trying to do your social media requirements. You're trying to figure out what to do with this money and that money. It kind of adds another distraction there. But you're also an 18-year-old man, right? You can now vote. You can go to war. Like, you should be allowed to get paid as other kids can. So it's just part of being an adult, too. And now, you might not have that prefrontal cortex formed yet, but hopefully you've got smart people around you. But I see the pros and cons of each, and I see what you're saying. I also see about taking advantage of what colleges are making money off of anyway. But it's just how this plays out is going to be so very interesting. Yeah, but you know, the, the one thing too with the colleges and making money off it, and I agree, but if you look at the colleges, yeah, the athletes are taken care of. There are fabulous athletic dorms, but there are also libraries and research centers, you know? So it's it's not as if, I, I mean, all the money that T. Boone Pickens gave to Oklahoma State, right. you know, it just wasn't for the football stadium or the basketball stadium, you know? So there's a lot of good going in from athletic money that all the students benefit from also. Yeah, absolutely. You're so, right. you know, off this topic now during your coaching career, who's been a player that showed up for you and just been a pure surprise. Surprise. Yeah. I know Richie Kelly, that was a good one for you going from, uh, you know, his one offer to Boston college, but what about another player that showed up and maybe, cause the thing is about being a prep school coach that, that some people don't understand is, you don't always see these kids in person until they show up to campus. And sometimes I, I, they're better. Sometimes they're about what you expected. Sometimes they're worst. So I, I, I don't think in 13 years I've seen three players live. Wow. When I them. So your opening day of school is it's like, it's Christmas. You're seeing kids for the first time. You're unwrapping the package. And then some kids like, which of those kids have turned out to be really big surprises for you? Well, you know, the, the kid, Willie Rodriguez that came up out of um, Orlando, Florida, you know, he had all this great hype in Orlando, but nobody knew where he was. Nobody knew who, as a matter of fact, he was thinking about going to the Air Force. And Willie came up for a postgraduate year, six foot six, very skilled. And the first day of open gym, he set more picks than Wes Unseld ever set in his life. <laughs> and, and I'm like sit, sitting there talking to my coaches. I'm like, what the heck is this? You know, the kid supposedly scored 2,000 points down in Florida, and he sets picks like Wes Unsell. So I walked up to him in between, you know, games. I said, Will, I brought you up here to score. I brought you up here because you're a scorer. He looks at me and he says, 
God sets the picks on his open coach. And I'm like, you know what? We might have something with this kid. And he went from one offer to probably at, at last count when he was in his PG year, is that like 23? And he fell in love with one assistant coach. And it was at a school that probably gets as much snow as any college in the country. And this kid's from Orlando, Florida. And he stuck with that school because he loved the assistant coach. And he was the all-time leading scorer, all-time leading rebounder at school. That he was, and to this, he's still playing professionally in Puerto Rico. He was a first round pick down there. And he still calls me opening day when, when he sees, plays for Arecibo. He's like, coach, you come to a game this year. Um, he, he was, he was an unbelievable surprise. That's a great um, story. Tom, Tom, Tommy Herter, uh, Kevin Herter's older brother, uh, came to do a PG year with us and didn't really have any offers coming out of high school. Um, I think, I think part of it is, well, there was a kid two years younger than him on his high school team and just happened to be the kid that slept in the room across the hall from him, but he came in and he just worked and he just played and, uh, Jimmy Patso gave him a full ride at Siena. He ended up playing and graduating from Siena. Um, you know, so th th those are two really great stories. Um, you know, I had another kid, um, got a preferred walk on at Bentley high academic school, which is a well-known business school. And I said to the coach at Bentley, I said, you know, you stole this kid. He goes, no, I didn't. He says, everybody else missed a boat on him. He decided to come to me. So, sophomore year, full scholarship, junior, senior year, captain. I said, coach, you stole the kid. He says, I know, you know, and, and those, those are, those are stories you love though. But tell me this on the flip side of that, without naming names, give me an example of what happened when a kid showed up and was less than what you thought and it didn't work out. Like what lesson could you give kids out there on, on what not to do potentially? No, that's a great question. I, I, I've yet to have a kid underachieve athletically in all this time. Um, what I've had is kids that came to this level and refuse to figure out that, oh my God, these guys are pretty darn good. And I'm not the best kid here as I was in that little town I was at. Right. And, with, and with that, you just gotta, you know, talk to these kids about um, an understanding what the game is, you know, because when you're 30 years old and you're standing around the water cooler at IBM, you're, you're just a former college basketball player. You weren't a former D1 kid. You weren't a former D3 kid. You know, you, you're just a former college basketball player and everybody looks up to you. And having that hard conversation with kids, um, there, there are a lot of kids that underachieve. And the main reason they underachieve is because they don't know how to work hard enough. Physically, they're good, but they don't know how. And, and that's what you got to get out of these kids. I mean, I, I had a kid years back that was, was a very, very, very good player, but his forte was defense. And I would put him in the game, and I don't care if it was a 6'10 kid or a 5'10 kid, you're guarding. And inevitably, when the coach took that kid out for a break, and my kid was absolutely doing 100% what he was told to do, I would take him out because I wanted him to rest because I knew that other guy was coming back in and he'd come out pouting coach, come on, I got it going on, you know, this and that. I said, you go back in the game. All of a sudden the other kid that came up who, who we basically paired with him. I called a kid, boom, go. And about three or four games, he finally figured it out. And one game, the kid subs out and he starts walking in the bench. I hadn't even grabbed the sub yet. I'm like, yo, Mel, what are you doing? He says, I did what the team needed, coach, get somebody else in. He went on to go to college, played, was the same defensive stopper in college. So I, I think, you know, if you're honest, and, and, and people say be honest with kids, there's degrees of honesty. And when you are brutally honest, here is where 
you can be effective at the next level. If you don't choose to take that advice, I can go to sleep at night. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm kind of getting off subject, but, you know, underachievers are only people that won't listen to common sense and act on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, we've come to the point where we're doing a lightning round here. And okay. these are quick hitters, and uh, I'm excited to hear your responses to this. All right. Go ahead. What's the biggest win of your career? Beating Wilbraham and Munson the year that Joel Mario was a freshman and Wayon Gabriel was a senior, both Sudanese kids, Wayon going to the University of Kentucky, and we got them in our gym. It was sold out to the rafters. This is when I was at Cheshire. Um, probably the biggest win. Gotcha. Who's the best player you ever coached against? Donovan Mitchell. You didn't pause on that one second. The best. He was a sophomore in high school. We played him first game of the year, beat him 67-64. I'm driving home in my car. I call Mike Bray. I call Fran McCaffrey. I call John Beeline. I said, offer this kid and work backwards. Mike kept, what do you mean? Just call him up and offer, call his coach, offer him right now, work backwards. He's the best player I've ever seen. Where is he playing at that time? He was at Canterbury before, as a sophomore, before he went up to Booster. Don, and plus, the classiest kid. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable shortstop in baseball. Um, just, he, he was the whole package, best player I ever coached against. Wow. That's great. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Riding my bike along the beach and golfing and hanging out, hanging out. I got, I got a pretty cool family cause I got triplets, two boys and a girl. They were all athletes. You know, my wife is, you know, as everybody says, I outkick my coverage. She's so much better than me. So we live down by the beach and that's what I do. <laughs> that sounds great and last one here kev what is your favorite movie of all time kelly's heroes oh wow. plenty of slid. yeah probably the best cast could be in the history of movies if you look up who was in that movie i'm gonna i'm gonna make an admission here i've never seen that i should have and i'm putting it on my list to watch as soon as possible <laughs> super Corey. i really appreciate your time Kevin, it's great having you on. We talk a lot and, um, you know, about a lot of guys. I respect your uh, your knowledge on the game and you think outside the box with stuff. And it was just a pleasure to have you on today. So I really thank you for, for coming on board. Thank you. Enjoy the kids and have a great day. Thanks. Real quick here. Thanks for joining in. You can subscribe to YouTube. You can subscribe to all the podcast platforms. Uh, that way you'll never miss an episode on uh, of this podcast. And uh, stay tuned for the next episode. And thank you for tuning in. This has been the Prep Athletics Podcast with Corey Heights and our guest today, Coach Kevin Kehoe. Thank you very much. 